welcome to the soft matter show this is amal narayana i am a chemist and a polymer scientist in this podcast we will talk about soft matter science and have fireside chats with the researchers please enjoy the show today's guest is dr niels holton anderson niels is a professor of the program in polymers and soft matter at the massachusetts institute of technology in this conversation we took a deep dive into the world of biomimetic materials specifically niels shared his knowledge in muscle adhesion and transient mechanics of biological materials since we both carry a mutual interest in biological adhesives some parts of the conversation may get a little technical please bear with it i'm sure that you will learn a lot more about the fascinating field of muscle adhesion from this conversation being an avi traveler himself nils also sh- shared his perspectives on working in the west midwest and the northeast of the united states i'm a big fan of nils's f- philosophy towards research and had fun hearing from him i'm sure that you will also feel the same please enjoy this episode thank you we have dr nils holton anderson in the soft matter show today nils is a professor of the program in polymers and soft matter at the massachusetts institute of technology mit he is known for his extraordinary contributions in revealing the roles of adhesive proteins found in aquatic organisms not only he is an expert in understanding biological adhesives but also he has created soft stimuli responsive synthetic materials based on the concepts observed in these organisms he has published tons of peer reviewed articles and is the is the current vice chair of the gordon conference on science of adhesion with that introduction let's hear from nils welcome to the soft matter show nils thank you very much i'm very happy to be here now thank you for doing this yeah this has been my passion project too you know kind of sort of explore the unknown areas of academics and research so i think it's yeah awesome thank you so one of the things i wanted to ask you like this i had not asked it, this to anyone because you from looking at your profile or your background and the interactions that we have had i know that you are an avid traveler you travel quite a lot because you have moved places from you know starting from denmark you have been to us all parts of us actually so you did your p undergrad in um, in denmark then you came to us for the phd and you went to first to the uh, to the california side then you went more towards the midwest for your postdoc then you're mm-hmm. working now in the northeast so yeah. what are the two places that you have enjoyed the most living or visiting <laughs> oh That's a good question. Um you know you know there's actually one one place that I I also visited in between Denmark and California. So I actually did a a year abroad as an undergrad student in New Zealand mm-hmm. in in Christchurch on the South Island. And so that was sort of my first real big long trip. far away from home. Um so I want to say that that still stands out as a really special place to me. Uh so it's far away from everything else but but anyone who's either been to New Zealand or have have sort of seen pictures from it can can attest that it's it's a beautiful beautiful place. Um and the people there are extremely friendly. Um I so I want to say New Zealand and in particular the south island uh, is is one of my most special places also because on a personal note that's actually where i met my wife who who is american who is the real reason i came to the us so <laughs> so that's there's a, a such very a story yeah <laughs> yeah so there's a very uh, personal uh, connection to that too and in the us you know Santa Barbara for anyone who's been there is obviously beautiful. It's it's such a beautiful place. Um but I really fell in love with uh, Chicago where I did my postdoc. So that was my first time ever staying and living in a big American city. Um and I really enjoyed Chicago. I thought it was it was it's a beautiful city. The architecture of Chicago is is incredible. Um and and the research in in Chicago uh, that is 
basically why I got to study at University of Chicago was was just phenomenal. I, I enjoyed it a lot. But this getting to live in in that city um, was was just a real enjoyable experience. So I would I would say New Zealand and, and Chicago if, wow. if I had to pick. <laughs> Yeah, that is like very contrasting picks, actually. One is a city, yes. one is like, you know, more of a landscape, uh, yes. you know, extraordinary landscape. Yeah, one, one day I could, I wish if I could go to New Zealand and see the places. Here. You should. <laughs> it's far away. It's a long journey, mm-hmm. but but it's uh, it's well worth it. It's such an incredible place uh, to, to get to travel in. Definitely. So in terms of the work, like in terms of working in the West Coast, Midwest and Northeast, so what what have you found to be the differences across uh, these uh, three different places? Um, I would say, and I don't know how much of this is is sort of emanating from the culture of the different places or whether it was just the sort of local environment of where I work. But I will say that, you know, this, this reputation, at least I had heard about the Northeast being a much more high pace, busy uh, culture and, and work environment. I have found that to be true. Uh, I, I definitely feel it's a lot faster pace uh, up here in the Northeast. And, and, and again, this is just Boston that I've experienced, right? Um, and that's not to say that people, you know, of course, don't work hard and are super ambitious in Santa Barbara or in Chicago, but there's just something about the culture out here in the Northeast that it just makes people a little more, well, this sounds negative, but but a little more anxious, I, I think. And, and hence, they sort of pace themselves a little faster. Uh, so it's not that it's better or worse. I feel it's just different. Whereas in, in Santa Barbara, I felt there was definitely more at, at the university, there was definitely more a, a culture of it's okay to slow down. And, and and sort of take your time with, with your work and with your studies. And it was also not a big city. It's a, Santa Barbara is a small collegiate town, right? So it was a very sort of quiet place to live. Um, but I definitely feel the difference between Santa Barbara and Boston is 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 big in, in sort of the pace of, of work, for sure. So how does that affect uh, as a researcher for you? Like, you know, uh, PhD students starting, I mean, I can understand like for an undergrad versus a PhD student, it could be very different. Like for an undergrad, yeah. the pace is just about the, the you, know, the, you know, learning things and you're like fast in that part. But for a PhD student, like they are in for the long term, they are in there for, yeah. like, you know, for a marathon, actually, I prefer yeah. to call it. So how do you think that would be affecting the students? Uh, that's a good question. Um I feel very lucky that I, you know, not not in any conscious way, but that I got to do my PhD at a place where moving slower was embraced because that is much more my nature uh, to to sort of move slow with with research and discovery and take your time and really understanding things at a very deep level. Whereas I think I would have felt it would have been a hard fit for me to be a PhD student here uh, in in the Northeast if if I hadn't been allowed to move at my own pace. I think I would have felt frustrated um, being feeling the need to sort of move ahead before I fully understood things. So I think it, it definitely, ma- and, and, and again, I'm not saying moving slow the way I do is, is better. I think it's just a matter of what is your personal preference. Uh, and I think for, a, you're right, a, a PhD is five years, I mean, they go fast, but it's still, you know, a, a good amount of time to dive into a topic. Um, so for me, if it's sort of a PhD that's centered more on scientific scholarship and understanding, a, a, a culture that embraces a slower moving pace, I think is a better fit than than something that's a little more focused on generating output and, and maybe even applications um, where maybe you can get away with a little less in-depth understanding, but more optimization for some sort of application, um, which I think also touches maybe a little bit. And I say this very much well, as a scientist in nature. I'm, I'm not an engineer. Um, and, and, and so to me, being a scientist works better with, with allowing yourself to move slow at times. Whereas I've observed from, from my current environment that, that engineers um, are more comfortable with with moving fast, uh, even if not everything is understood at the most 
detailed level, it's understood well enough that you can you can apply your knowledge to to design an, an application, right? So I think it's also a matter of just personal preference of of how how deep you want to go in the work that you do and how fast you want to move. Yeah. Since you brought that point of you know science and engineering, so do you have any definition for like you know the difference between a scientist and an engineer? It's it's a tough um, question, I know, but yeah, just... <laughs> I, you know, and and I think as as always, oh. and this is sort of a, a a vague answer. I think there's a spectrum, right? right. Um, mm-hmm. It's it's obviously not black and white. Um, but I, my PhD advisor was was definitely uh, a scholar in the true meaning of the word. Herb Wade is his name, um, and and a scientist. Um, a lot of his discoveries have been applied in in various fields of engineering but he was definitely one that that uh, trained us as scientists us students um so I, I really do think for me one of the differences is pace um i i just feel that and pace i don't mean that that it's it's that scientists don't work hard i think they work just as hard but so my i'll use an analogy that my phd advisor oftentimes brought up um, in sort of approach to science, and I feel maybe that applies somewhat to science versus engineering, is very true Southern California style, um, surface versus divers, right? Um, and, and do you align yourself more with being a diver and sort of really go deep and, and stay down and, and, and come back up with new knowledge? Or are you more comfortable with you know, moving around on the surface and, and enjoying the dynamics and, and the fast movements up there. Um, and I, I, yeah, again, I, I think maybe engineers are a little more comfortable with that faster pace and, and a little lighter touch at times, whereas scientists are a little more comfortable with, with really diving deep into things um, and, and sticking with it, even if it takes a while. Yeah, that's a fantastic analogy because it, <laughs> that's one of the best answers I have ever heard. I guess. Well, it's, again, it's it's all my my PhD advisor. But, yeah, I have had I a chance. To me, to, I have had a chance to meet him and interact with him. Actually, he's a fantastic person to talk to. He's fun to talk to. He, I agree. Yeah, he's very opinionated, but he's a fantastic person to you know talk to science about. Yeah. Yes, he is very knowledgeable. Yeah, most of I mean, my work was also like based on a lot of his his contributions to the field yes. of uh, adhesion. So, yes. so since we are like talking about the you know, you are moving dif- from p- places to different places, mm-hmm. and one of the things that also like when you moved the places, the one of the things that you have changed is also your research, because you. Yeah. If I, I mean, it's it's a very drastic change that you have done. Yes. Like I have had yes. chemist people coming to me and t- telling about, okay, I did, I used to do organic chemistry, now I do inorganic chemistry, that kind of transition. Yeah. For yeah. you, it's like you started as a biologist, then yeah. you moved to a, like, you know, cell biology, then you moved yeah. to biomechanics, yeah. then now you're working on almost like an interface of chemistry and engineering. Yeah. How yeah. did that happen? Like, it, was it a choice base or is it like this? You went with the flow. It it was very much the latter. Uh-huh. It was very unplanned and very go with the flow. So again, I'm not saying that's necessarily a smart. I, I don't think it is a strategy. I think it's very, if I'm pronouncing that word, serendipitous. Mm-hmm. I just just very much you know coincidences and following my curiosity, and and um, definitely not planned. I think looking back. Maybe what I, I didn't know at the time, but what really appealed to me about biology and, and the way we learned it in Denmark at that time was you start with sort of big scale biology, so sort of ecology and, and marine ecology, terrestrial ecology, like really large length and time scales. And then you specialized into sort of molecular biology if you wanted to. And I think there, what I realized looking back now is that I like the way molecules assembled. In bi- I like that idea of how molecular assembly takes place inside cells and between cells. And and, and so when I, I came to Santa Barbara and realized that, that you could actually study that aspect of biology, but what that means in terms of how biology makes materials or, or assembles materials for mechanical functions, that really fascinated me. 
I had never had a chance to study mechanics at that time, but, but I found it really appealing um, that you could sort of try to understand molecular assembly and dynamics and measure it through mechanics. Um, and, and I didn't even know there was a field of material science. We, I had never been introduced to it in Denmark, really, as a biologist, certainly. So, so that's why I feel biological materials or materials evolved in nature was such a fascinating combination of what I loved in biology and, and this new field of mechanics and physics and chemistry. Um, so it was very sort of just go with the flow and, and follow my curiosity along the way. And then going to Chicago was where I got introduced to, to soft matter mm-hmm. um, and completely fell in love with that because that was then sort of an even deeper dive into taking simple design principles, if you want, that we had discovered in biology and then trying to integrate them in very simple molecular materials, polymer materials, hydrogels, and then realizing that once again, you can use mechanics or in particular rheology, which is something I got introduced to in Chicago to understand dynamics. That just blew my mind that you with, you know, I'd learned a lot in biology and biochemistry at that point about various types of spectroscopies, like different types of chemical spectroscopies and ways to study structure in biology, right? But this idea that you can use mechanics, in particular rheometer, as a mechanical spectrometer, really use it as a tool to measure the manifestation, the mechanical manifestation of molecular dynamics. That still blows my mind to this yeah. day. I think that is so cool, right? Yeah. That, that you and you talk with rheologists, and that's like, well, yeah, it is a mechanical spectrometer, right? But as a molecular biologist of training, it's like, wow, you can measure mechanically how molecules are touching each other, right? Uh, that that blows my mind. Yeah, everything comes down to Newton's law, ultimately, I think. Yes, so that yes. is the fun part of what uh, you know, doing mechanics or anything related to rheology. So yes. as a biologist, like, I mean, this was a question I really wanted to ask in the later section, but since you brought up the, the rheology term, so what what were some of the resources, like, you know, that helped you to understand the rheology better? Was it like, or key persons who has helped you to, you know, transform your knowledge from biomechanics to rheology or soft matter materials? Yeah. Yeah, I think, so So again, at Chicago, definitely the people I was lucky to to be able to learn from were, were definitely the, the people who opened my eyes to that world. So there's many, many great people in Chicago. So my postdoc advisor, Kai Lee, whose lab I was in, she was really the one who, who opened my eyes to sort of interfacial phenomena and, and how chemical dynamics can really translate to measurable mechanics. Rheology was something I learned uh, from from a group uh, led by Heinrich Jäger at Chicago. They had, uh, you know, a couple of rheometers, one that, that you could share uh, with the rest of the department. And so it was really him and his students and postdocs that I learned rheology from. After I had found a way to make these muscle-inspired gels, I just spent many, many days and, and, and months in their lab really learning what does it mean to characterize the scholastic properties of these materials. And then there's uh, a great uh, uh, physicist uh, named Margaret Gardell, who studies uh, cytoskeletal networks. She taught me a lot of, of basic uh, uh, rheology and how to interpret rheology. And in a very uh, great uh, polymer uh, theory uh, scholar named Tom Whitten, who, who I had a lot of discussions with, too, in terms of what, what, what does this really mean in terms of how the molecules are behaving. So all of this was new to me. I'd never had physics at that level and then soft condensed matter physics, so really learning a lot from, from the people at Chicago. In terms of papers, though, I'll, I think the papers that really opened my eyes to how to interpret my own research and sort of this entryway into understanding how chemistry and chemical dynamics couples to soft matter mechanics is Steve Craig at Duke. His his papers, because he he is more of a chemist, I would say, of training, and, and that definitely is also more my background. So the way that he introduced and demonstrated how chemistry can be manifested again in mechanics, really, when I read his papers, I was like, wow, this is what I'm seeing. And that really spoke to me his way of explaining, he has a paper, he has many papers on that, but one of his early papers, a short Jack's paper named Strong, or titled is Strong Means Slow. 
No, slow means strong. I forget which way they, they, but they're basically explaining very elegantly that the time scale of the molecular interaction is is really the kinetics of the of the of the molecular interaction, the crosslink interaction, the dynamic crosslink, is really what sets the bulk time scale of the network. And they have an elegant way of showing that in their systems. But that's when I realized this is essentially what I am trying to understand in my own system. So I think Steve Craig's papers from for chemists that are trying to understand what chemistry can mean in terms of bulk mechanics, that those are really great uh, papers to read. Yeah, Steve Craig's uh, contributions as a very important in uh, mechanophore chemistry is because I, mean, exactly. I was also all, like we had him two years or four years ago uh, during the Gordon Adhesion Conference. And I have met yes. him in Akron as well. Like he was a fantastic speaker. He yes, has he, his, uh, he has a way of showing that color change as a function of the yeah. stress, which yeah. tells you like, oh, this is really a thing. Like, you know, when you press something, you'd never think before that you press something that like, you know, it's how you're pressing a plastic or you're like, you know, uh, but when you see that stress is like, you know, distributed in the network and you can see it yeah. visually, that's like a magical yeah. thing to see. Actually. No, it is. It is. And his, his papers, you know, his papers are very well written. Yeah, exactly. Um, so, 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 so reading them, I, you know, I read it's, it's some of these papers you bump into along the way and you go back to them again and again. And that was the case for, for those key papers for me. I, I read them at least 10 times, mm -hmm. over, like over a period of years, right? But every time I got a little deeper into interpreting what it was they were saying and how that related to my own work. So he's a real scholar, uh, both in, in his writing as well as his presentations. Yeah, exactly. So so now that we are like talking about the research aspect and like, you know, you're talking about the muscle adhesion or the mechanics of muscle-inspired materials, so what are some of the current research topics that excites you the most that you are trying to chase in your lab? Yeah, I think on a on a broader scale, one thing that keeps puzzling me, but also getting me very excited for the future is this idea of not just muscle inspired, but bio inspired soft matter in general. In the muscles case, we and others discovered that they use metal coordinate bonds to control sort of the dynamic mechanical properties of, of these adhesive materials, right? And we're, we've been trying to understand what metal coordinate chemistry does in terms of mechanics. But there are many other types of non-permanent bonds out there, right? Hydrogen bonding has been studied for a long time as, as another type of transient crosslink with which you can tune viscoelasticity, right? So that has been used in polymer chemistry for a long time. You know that even better than me, right, with your own work. But it's there are many types of non-covalent, non-permanent bonds with which you can tune dynamics between molecules. So one thing that really puzzles me, and I don't think anyone has a good understanding of yet, is why did biology choose, for lack of a better word, to use one type of transient bond in some materials and another one in other materials? So why is it that the muscle and other marine organisms use metal coordinate chemistry type crosslinks? for these types of materials, but other organisms and the muscle in other types of, of materials use, say, hydrogen bonding. So what is it about, I mean, at a very fundamental level, when you look at the mechanics of polymer networks or macromolecular networks held together with either hydrogen bonds or metal bonded bonds, biologically, or, or looking at their viscoelastic properties, they look very similar, right? They have transient interactions, they have transient time scales that gives them a bulk relaxation time, right? But why is it then that you in biology do find these different chemistries in different applications, so to speak? There must be something else we're missing. So this, this choice of what type of transient bond you apply to solving what type of problem, I think that's something we still need to learn from, from biology uh, in terms of bio-inspired soft materials. And then another sort of more even higher level thing that really fascinates me and gets me excited is that the way I learned about molecular assembly in biology and, and in, in other fields too, I would say, is it's a very sort of almost static, I mean, there's a dynamic aspect to it because you know the molecules are assembling, but, but there's a very traditional focus on structure, right? That, that it is very much about these molecules have evolved in biology 
to to have a shape and a, and a molecular chemistry that allows them to sort of assemble as almost autonomous building blocks mm. into these idealized structures. And these idealized structures have a function, right? But, you mean but in, terms of really, the, in terms of the, the three-dimensional three structure, like in a protein structure, is that what you mean? Exactly. exactly. Well, and even, even longer link, uh, link scale assembly, so you have many proteins assembling into a material, for example, right? This, this idea that, that structure dictates function, I think is, is true, but, but one thing that, that, again, rheology and viscoelastic properties have really taught me is that the axis of time, like the, the dynamics and, and the time scales of these structures, they're not static, still sitting uh, material assemblies, right? They, they, they breathe on, on, on many different length scales, right? And, and the manifestation of that over many different time scales, I think, is something that we still don't understand from, from, from biological materials. At least, again, soft condensed matter physicists and rheologists know that dynamics on the axis of time are, are, are just as important as structure on the axis of, of space, right? But I think for, for, for molecular biologists and sort of bio-inspired material scientists, that axis of time is something that is much less explored that the dynamics of these self-assembled materials in biology that people are so excited about understanding need to be studied on an axis of time as well as on an axis of space, right? But it's not just about this static picture of structure. It's also about this dynamic picture of molecular dynamics, right? Yeah. Um, so on that note, what I think is really not understood, even once you have a functional structure assembled, a functional material assembled, you can then sort of measure the, the mechanical dynamics of it. But I think as, it's ex as that structure is assembling, how mechanics might actually manipulate that, I think is something, I'm curious whether biology also uses that. It's not just that it's sort of evolved magic molecules that knows how to self-assemble self into these beautiful three-dimensional material structures. I also wonder whether as these molecules are assembling, Biology uses mechanics to perturb the energy landscape to actually drive assembly down different paths. You mean in terms of like providing it as environment or like a cofactor exactly. or things like that to get the shape to the shape that they want for that exact function. Exactly. And so I think I, I wouldn't be surprised. I mean, this is speculation completely, but I wouldn't be surprised. I don't think materials assembled in, in nature by just sort of dumping a bunch of molecules together and then stepping away and letting it happen. I think they're very dynamic environment. Of course, people know that there's enzymes involved, there's all kinds of chemical input, but I wonder whether there's mechanical input mm -hmm. and, and mechanical bias as structures are assembling, right? And whether a sort of controlled mechanical input as molecules are trying to find their lowest thermodynamic equilibrium can, can actually bias different assembly pathways. If yeah. that makes sense. Yeah, that's a fantastic question to, you know, follow because you are thinking it from a philosophical point of what if, like, can we, like, can the molecules reassemble uh, based on the mechanical input, right? Yeah, and that's can fantastic. they follow different yeah. assembly paths as a function of sort of perturbing or biasing that energy landscape mm -hmm. under which the molecules are trying to minimize energy, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. So that's something that I think is, you you know, now we've learned a lot, or I've learned a lot about how to use mechanics to characterize already assembled structure, but can we actually also use mechanics to maybe even control assembly of structure, right? Wow, that's a fantastic I think that could be really, actually. really fascinating yeah. uh, thing to, and, and again, I wouldn't be surprised if biology is already doing that. Right? <laughs> yeah, I um, agree. We, we'll find it out in 20 years, I guess. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, one exactly. of the things I wanted to ask, like, like in the in the to the into the same point that we are talking right now, into the first section of that you're you're saying that if the biology, why did the biologist choose um, hydrogen bonding or the metal coordination or the vice versa? So, do you have any hypothesis on why that happened? I do, but again, there's there, there are hypotheses mm -hmm. and speculation. But but I wonder again. I know most about metal coordination, or at least I believe I do. I, I, it strikes me that the materials in, in nature where metal coordination have now been found are all secreted materials, meaning that they're 
I think the, a classical term is called extraorganismal materials. So they're materials that are sort of secreted outside the body of these organisms. So muscles are an example. I know you've studied uh, and been inspired by sandcastle, uh, two building worms as well. I mean, they depending on what ion the organisms use, whether it's technically a metal coordinate bond or an ionic bond, that's a bit fuzzy. But um, snail slime actually is another material now, this, this sort of sticky glue that snails secrete, which is, again, not surprising that they have been found to use metal coordinate bonds because they're actually, uh, evolutionarily speaking, closely related to mussels. They're just terrestrial mm -hmm. rather than marine. Um, but, but in a lot of these secreted materials, metal coordinate chemistry seems to be uh, a cross-link chemistry of choice that have evolved. And so my hypothesis is whether it actually whether metal coordinate chemistry is good for assembly of, of, of material function, of, of material with, with, with load-bearing functions, whether that's sort of very weak uh, viscoelastic properties for snail slime or more permanent load-bearing structures like a muscle adhesive. But I think controlling fluid-solid transitions, basically, uh, during assembly, I think maybe metal coordinate chemistry is... is is offering ways to control that that isn't necessarily possible with, say, hydrogen bonding. And, and it gets into sort of fundamental physical chemistry, kinetics and thermodynamics that I still don't understand. But I think that very fact that you actually have an ion around which molecules are binding to each other, so it's sort of an ABA type interaction instead of just an AA or a BB or even an AB. So hydrogen bonding motifs obviously are transient and can stick to each other, but having that central node of an ion between them I wonder what that does, whether it does something special for mixing. Mm -hmm. uh, that, that you can play with stoichiometries in ways that you can't if it's just a self-complementary type of hydrogen bonding assembly, right? And I wonder whether that offers unique ways to control assembly. That, yeah, that's I think sort that of could happen. Speculation. Like if you think from a water's perspective also, um, you need some kind of uh, you know mechanics, some mechanism which will be tolerant to water as well. Hydrogen yeah, yeah. bond may be, you know, get disrupted by a lot of water. Yes, so that yes. That could be one of the things which no, we can and, think and of. No, and that's a very good point, Amal. That's actually when you said something that, that I'm excited about with future. Like the fact that, and that goes back to when I first sort of by chance almost found a way to make these metal coordinate hydrogels. The fact that these bonds work so well in, in a hydrogel, in, in such a high screening solvent as water, is still a mystery, mm -hmm. right? Where, where if you're right, if it's a very simple hydrogen bond, it'll quickly get screened out by water. You really need to protect that hydrogen bonding motif if it is to have any energy well that's deep enough to have any sort of permanence to it in a solvent like water. These metal coordinate bonds, it's, I mean, yes, it's certain ligands, but, but as long as you have those ligands and you mix the metal lines and you turn the pH in the right direction, these, the way that these electrons are shared between the organic ligand and the d orbitals of the metal just has a, a lifetime to it that's incredible, considering that they are surrounded by water molecules. And that, that's something that I can think from a mechanical perspective is really fascinating. Yeah, so superb stuff, actually. So muscles like we will uh, go a little bit more deep into the muscles aspect of mm -hmm. it. so first let me ask you what when is the first time you saw a muscle live i think it would yeah i think it would have to be when i was so so uh, i grew up in denmark as you said and my family still lives there so i have two older brothers and we used to fish a lot on the coast of, of denmark and one of the beaches we would oftentimes go to as kids even before we sort of started using fishing rods it had some, uh, like a little reef outside it with big boulders. And in the summertime, you can climb out on that reef and it'd be covered with mussels. And what you could do is collect a mussel, crack the shell open, tie it to a seaweed that would also grow on these rocks, and then actually use that as a lure to capture big crabs between the, the rocks. So we would sort of oftentimes climb out there and try to pull these mussels off to use them as bait, basically, for catching big crabs. And uh, that's when I realized these things are really hard to pull off. Yeah. Uh, and, and it's sort of only the ones that sit at the edge of a mussel colony that you can really get to, even at low tide, right? Uh, because the ones that are sitting hunkered down in the middle, 
you're going to cut your hands almost trying to pull them off uh, because they're they're bound so tightly to to the rock, right? And and that's yeah. I guess I think that would be the first time that I really had uh, an intuition that these are stuck really really well. So, what is the opinion of your brothers when you say that you're working on the muscles that we use for fishing? <laughs> they they well, I think they they just. I think maybe my family always knew that my if if I got the chance at least to make a living off asking questions. <laughs> that would be that would be it because for better or worse i've asked a lot of questions as a kid um to try to understand anything really around us um that's i've always been very inquisitive um of trying to understand yeah anything whether that's math physics chemistry or biology um so i think they they feel it's a good fit mm-hmm. so how did you develop that like that's one of the things that i have noticed about you as well like you ask a lot of questions you are Yes. Really curious to learn. How did you develop yeah. that aspect of you know asking questions? Is it like, is there any you know? Is, do you have any tips for people who wants to become more curious? I it's a good question, and and I, the honest answer is I I don't really know where it came from. Um, I I just as long as I remember, to the point of almost being annoying as a kid, and my parents just just go outside. <laughs> <laughs> Because I, I would just always ask a lot of questions and, and I've always been obsessed with trying to really understand things that are very, it, it frustrated me immensely as a kid when I didn't understand things yeah. uh, in school. Um, and so I would, again, t- sometimes to a point where I would just not even want to talk with anyone else, just really try to sit and understand something very, very, until I was satisfied with my level of understanding. So, so how did so, you, how did you use to yeah. achieve that? How did you use to like understand that? Like you used to sit and read, or yeah, both read, but also just really sort of contemplate uh, for for better or worse. I mean, yeah, really just quiet uh, contemplation. Um, and then I think one thing that that I learned later on, which is just as important, I think for me at least, in terms of understanding, trying to understand things, is also learning to be okay. With not understanding everything right away, right? Because you you can't obviously, and especially if you move into a new field, the exciting part is there's a lot of new things to learn, but also accepting that it's going to take a little bit of time, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and so, I think it took. It wasn't until I was in college that I realized that um, there's also a beauty in in allowing yourself to sit in in uncertainty, and and actually having been introduced to something in a class. Or, or through a discussion and realizing I don't understand that yet, but but not let it frustrate you in sort of a negative way, but but just be more curious and and sort of say okay I don't understand it now, but I want to and and where do I now seek out the next step to try to get a deeper understanding? That took me a little bit of time because I think it ta- at least for me, it's a matter of sort of having the I don't know whether confidence is the right word, but the or courage maybe i don't know but but to allow yourself to admit to yourself you don't understand something and and still not just run away from it but but sit with it and then pursue what it takes to to understand it and the same thing about asking questions again for peter always i mean we've been at many conferences together i do ask a lot of questions and it's not because i want to show off or be annoying or anything it's just the same thing if i don't understand something even if it's a question that everybody else understands i've sort of taught myself that well the only one that's gonna n- n- sort of get hurt if you're not hurt but but not benefit from nobody's going to benefit from me not asking this question and and if i don't ask it i won't know right yeah. so sort of getting over this fear of asking dumb questions is something i tried to to teach myself a long time ago so I don't want to sort of be the only one asking questions, but if there are opportunities and and nobody else is asking questions, I'm I'm never shy to mm-hmm. to ask a question. That's a good good thing actually. Like when you when somebody is giving a talk and at the end there is no question, it feels not good for the uh, the people. No, no, talking, I always right? feel yeah, yeah. <laughs> I always feel bad if I gave a talk and nobody has questions. It's like, well, <laughs> either they didn't care, which is okay, or I didn't do a good job, right? Yeah. So there's always a 
I always try to think of a question to ask. There's always something I don't understand in a talk that I would like to try to understand better. And if nobody else asks a question, I'll always try to ask something. Yeah, I have been a big fan of uh, curiosity-driven research, like where you have questions and you go for that questions. But sometimes the funding won't let you do that. But let's say you try no. to try your best to you know find the curiosity-driven path for yourself. That is the best yeah. way of doing research, I, I agree. So... Yeah. So going back to the muscles part, we'll I'll switch gears a little bit and we'll go back to the muscles part of uh-huh. it. So as you mentioned previously in, in our discussion itself that, you know, sandcastle worms is also one of the most discussed uh, organisms. But if you compare to many organisms, like, you know, barnacles, there is like, you know, sandcastle, compared to any organisms, yeah, muscles has been like, you know, vastly exploited. Yes, yes. So why did that happen? It, what, what what do you think uh, happened in that muscle-inspired boom? Yeah, I think the short answer, good point, um, and, and I don't have a, a great answer or a great understanding, but I think the short answer is, and it's going to be a biased answer from my point, is really Herb Wade, my PhD advisor. Because I think he, you know, he studied a lot of other organisms than muscle too. He was also one of the, the people who, who picked up the sandcastle worm and the chemistry of the sandcastle glue, right? Um, but but I think he, on his own, really got curious about muscle adhesion from a chemical perspective, right? And really published some early papers back in the 80s where he showed that catechol or dopa is, is part of this. Uh, and, and for a long time, as he would tell us when we were students, uh, you know, it was, uh, what did he call it? Esoteric research, which I think means sort of nobody else really cares, right? So I think there was a long timeline of sort of not a lot of, of, of in, well, not that it was an interest, but it wasn't really catching on the way that it then suddenly caught on from, I would say, the 2000s and onwards, right? Then it really picked up. So one, I think he other person that really picked up some of Herb's early work and began using it was Phil Messersmith, who, who was at Northwestern for a long time, and now he's at Berkeley. So he was the one who, and he has told me as much too, that he had sort of sat down and thought about, well, what what could he bring to to sort of the, the field of biomedical engineering of new new ideas? And he and he found Herb's papers and, and really had this idea of, can we now take some of this inside of, of underwater adhesion and try to translate it into polymer materials. And I think with his early work, um, together with Ken Shaw, uh, as well up at Northwestern, they really got a lot of people interested in how this potentially could be used, right? And then I think it's it's just, you know, Phil has had many great students, Herb has had, uh, and I'm not talking about myself, but <laughs> Herb has had other great students. And I think then it just sort of, the, the family tree, the academic family tree sort of propagates, right? And then, you know, then, then it grows, I think, from there. Um, but I think Herb sort of doing the fundamental studies of muscle adhesion and then Phil really picking it up uh, as, as a potential chemistry that could be translated into biomedical materials, that synergy really, really got, uh, got it whole started. And then Jacob later on, Jacob is for really him and her began collaborating a lot on studying surface force yes. uh, measurements of muscle proteins. And that all, I mean, Jacob is obviously was, was a tremendous scientist and, and, and engineer and, and his work was highly respected already. So I think once he also got interested and published even more people in the engineering field and, and interfacial uh, science and engineering got curious as well, right? So I think there were some key big people that really helped catapult it into sort of the spotlight. Yeah. So Jacob's work and, you know, Herbert's weights and, and even uh, Phil's work has influenced my work as well a lot. Yeah. Because I, had, yeah. I, have, I mean, I have cited and read their work numerous times uh, to, yes. in order to, you know, successfully <laughs> reach that this point of my life. Uh, I, I owe a lot of my PhD work to, you know, the contribution by Herb and uh, F- uh, Phil Messersmith as well as yeah. uh, Jacob. So, w- so they have tried their best to, you know, they have tried to spend a lot of time looking at the, the muscle adhesion and wh- how does it stick underwater? And they have yeah. provided a lot of numerous hypotheses from the biomechanics, biochemistry, and interfacial phenomena, all those aspects. 
But do you think like while working with muscles, do you think is there any point or any contribution from their side or something that you have seen which is less discussed or less explored from a muscle adhesion standpoint? Yeah, I think, and I think you you are one of the people with your own work that's really shedding light on this. That I think for a long time, because this work, Herb Herb is a I would say of. of tr- training a marine biochemist uh, or you know he, he he comes from a more chemistry centric background and so the focus of a lot of his early work was on on what does catecholic dopamine do with the interface right and and no doubt that there's a lot of evidence that suggests that the catecholin and the dopamine on the muscle he's approaching at the interface of a rock plays a role but but as you know even better than me It, the, the magic is not just the chemistry of the interface, right? A, a good adhesive is so much more than the interfacial chemistry, right? I mean, that, that again was something I only began to wrap my head around once I got introduced to, to polymer mechanics and dynamics, but pressure-sensitive adhesives stick without very strong interfacial chemistry, but they just have a lot of weak interactions that slowly add up to a strong bonded interface, right? So I think... What, what still to this day has not been that well characterized in, in muscle-inspired materials, and it's beginning now thanks to your work and other people's work, um, but is how does the interfacial catechol-based chemistry couple with the, the viscoelastic properties of the material above the interface, right? That, 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 that marriage or coupling between the interfacial chemistry that the muscle evolved and how that translates into viscoelastic dissipative mechanics in the overall adhesive, that's not that well understood. It, it's very clear now that it's not just, catechol can't do it alone, mm-hmm. right? Dopamine can't, Phil made a lot of polymers early on with dopamine as, as a side group, right? And they, they, that, that, that showed interesting fundamental properties, but that still wasn't a great, that's not an underwater adhesive by itself, right? There's much more needed within the material structure and dynamics to make a good underwater adhesive than just sticky side groups, right? Yeah. So I think that that coupling between chemistry and viscoelastic mechanics in the muscle adhesive is really not understood um, because there has for a long time been such a, a central emphasis on the interfacial chemistry, which is great and has, has generated a lot of insights, but it's definitely time to also understand how does that then couple to the to the bulk mechanics of the whole structure yeah yeah we can talk about muscle adhesion like you know through a whole day or if not yes. more like yes. when they go to an adhesion conferences and yes all. but le- let me switch a gear a little bit like here uh-huh. and like you know talk to you about from a professor or like a mentorship uh, kind of question so i have interacted with a lot of your students uh, they have had a extremely positive uh, a feedback on your mentorship skills so is there a trick or like is there a, f- a philosophy that you use in terms of being a mentor being a you know useful mentor yeah well that's a that's a tough question i think and the honest answer is i've, I've never really thought consciously about what i was striving for as i mean i you know to be honest i think I, I mimic, and well, at least initially subconsciously mimicked what I had seen from my own PhD advisor from her, that he was a very uh, supportive uh, mentor, both personally as, as well as scientifically and ac- academically, um, but also allowed us a lot of freedom to to pursue our own ideas. Um, like he he was not a mentor that would basically lay out your PhD project for you and say, well, this is where the funding is at, so you do this, 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 and this, right? It, it was it was very much about us as students, and I know this sounds cheesy, but us sort of finding our own journey or choosing our own journey with him always available to guide us or, or maybe not even guide us. He was always very apprehensive of telling us what to do, even when you asked him, like, <laughs> what do you think I should do here, right? He was very apprehensive of sort of laying out the options as he saw it, but let us make our own choice, right? That was frustrating sometimes as a student because you just wanted him to decide for you, right? So I think I've sort of, without knowing, but really 
deciding to do it, I think I have adopted a similar strat philosophy with my own students to really just try to um, help them as much as I can, uh, but but not make it about me, but but make it about what what they ultimately would like to do in making their own discoveries and me trying to help them as much as I can. Um, and, and it's not to make myself sound, you know, sacrificial or, you know, any, anything extraordinary. I think it's just the way I really liked being a, a PhD student myself is sort of finding my own path. And that's what I ultimately hope for my own students that, that I can help them find their own path and, and, and not just do what I tell them to do. Um, to be honest, too, I'm, all, I'm also not a very good boss. Like, I, you know, I, I don't, I feel uncomfortable telling people what to do. <laughs> so for better or worse, it ends up being very um, soft in, in terms of how I try to guide people. And then I also think there's a synergy there, right? I think there was a reason I was attracted to my PhD advisor, right? right? Because I've sensed something. I mean, I liked his science, but I really was was resonated with him as a human being, right? And I think my own students, it's been similar to, right? I think the people who need and like a boss to sort of tell them, here's what you should do because I say so, they would not pick me as an advisor because they quickly realize I'm not going to do that, right? Yeah. Whereas I think students that are a little more curious in finding their own path and also a little more willing to make their own mistakes probably resonate more with my sort of more hands-off style. Um, so I think there's a there's a mutual synergy there in, in sort of students picking advisors and advisors picking students. Yeah. yeah. So do you have any advice for the, the next generation scientists or people who wants to pursue a career in academia, except for going to New Zealand and find your, find your wife. <laughs> other than that, is there any other, <laughs> yeah, uh, uh, any other advice that you have for the young generation? Yeah. You know, I think, I mean, it sounds, Again, it's going to sound a little cheesy, but I really do think one advice I've been trying to tell myself is basically as I've gotten older, and it's hard. I, I keep trying to have to remind myself that don't try to be someone that you're not. Um, I, it's hard. At least I found it hard in academia because there's so much focus on success, right? And, and whatever that means and however it's quantified and measured, right? But there's so much pressure of sort of being able to sell your work, right? And, and sort of that very quickly, more and more with, with social media as well, becomes so tied to, to selling your brand as a person too. And so I think it's, it's hard not to sort of try to, to, to see yourself in relation to others and then get a very complex competitive feel to who you are as a researcher, right? That, oh, well, this person does this, this person does this, then I should be this to make myself stand out from this and this other person, right? Because that's that's what it feels like in sort of competitive academia right now, that, that you have to stand out, right? Your brand has to stand out, right? And I think that can quickly then, at least for me, it was hard to then figure out, is that really who I am or want to be as a researcher? Or is that just who I think strategically I should be? And, and so my advice would be to try to be brave enough to, to really stick to what you want to do. If, if you get the opportunity to follow your own ideas, stick to those. Because even if it doesn't work out at the end, that's what you're going to enjoy the most, right? Trying to be someone that you're not scientifically and creatively is going to, I think, not going to be enjoyable. I think you're going to be very unhappy. And I also don't think you're going to be good at it, right? Because being yourself is obviously what you're going to be best at. So that sounds very hippie and, and sort of yeah, cheesy. Is a wonderful but, advice, actually. But I think that's, that's, that's advice I would have given myself even more. Like, just stick to what you believe in, in terms of the, the creative discoveries you want to try to make. Perfect. But it's hard. It, it's definitely hard. Academia is getting very competitive mm. and, and sort of having a brand is becoming more and more important. And that brand to me seems more and more just as much about the person as it's about the work. And that scares me a little bit because to me, it should be more about the work than it should be about the humans doing the work. Yeah, fantastic. Right. I, I completely agree with your statements, actually. This is a fun, like in a wonderful list of 
uh, conversations that we had in this so is there anything like uh, this would be the last part of it so is there any anything that you wished i had asked or do you want to add something um no i think other than i wanted to make sure that i said thank you <laughs> yeah i think really for doing this no i mean that i think that's very uh, wonderful that you had this idea and took it upon yourself um, to to sort of showcase your own passion and not showcase but share your own passion and interest in in soft matter by by inviting people on to to talk with you i think that's awesome so thank you first and foremost and then i think you are an example of the student and it's not to sort of just be nice to you but i really do mean i remember talking with you and and seeing your work you like scholarship right you're you to me you're kind of old school that way that that you you want to do things at a deep level and and understand things well and and you're ambitious in going into depth and i just worry that that's a dying style with with i i i know we're getting inundated with more and more snippets of information on social media and life and in science and academia but i worry if if that way of sharing information and sharing discoveries just decreases our attention span more and more and and few and fewer people actually sit down and read a paper for a couple of hours and it's just oh i saw the title i saw the abstract i saw a picture on to the next thing mm-hmm. i really hope that doesn't become the way of the future of science because i think if we lose the depth and the scholarship discovery is going to suffer yeah i'm a um, big believer of being you know finding the time to you know read and like understand yeah. and and create the problem sometimes it's it's not easy to match because you know the funding might be you know you oh they, we don't have money to do this so then it becomes a different thing but yeah. i i am a complete and a true believer of uh, you know coming back of the scholastic uh, way of doing research and yeah. it gets more attention eventually i think yeah. yeah 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 so yeah thank you so much for like you know being taking the time and being a part of this of show course. we have a lot more people coming up and i'm i'll be i'm i'm truly mesmerized by the list as well as you are on this podcast so yeah we will meet next time at uh, science of adhesion or even <laughs> hopefully like when this is all over we can meet once again i guess absolutely uh, yeah it's going to be wonderful to be to be back together in person again but in the meantime again thank you amal it's very yeah. kind and gracious of you to take time to do this and, sure. and share it with the world yeah. for sure thank you thank you that's it for today guys i hope you all enjoyed this episode please find the show notes at the softmattershow.com for more details that is t h e s o f t m a t t e r s h o w .com You can write your questions, suggestions, and everything else to me at Amal Narayanan at thesoftmartyshow.com. See you with another exciting episode soon. Until then, goodbye.